everyone, welcome. On behalf of the Authors at Google program, I'm excited to welcome back Mary Roach. As one reviewer put it, Mary is one of the funniest and most madcap of science writers. She displays a firm belief that there is no question too goofy to ask or barring that to Google. Her previous books include Stiff, The Curious Lives of Human Cadavers, Spook, Science Tackles the Afterlife, and Bonk, The Curious Coupling of Science and Sex. Her newest book is Hacking for Mars, The Curious Science of Life in the Void. Now, most of us probably had childhood aspirations of becoming an astronaut, but Mary has done us the courtesy of researching all the things that our eight-year-old selves forgot to think of, like how do you keep clean up in space? Showers don't work without gravity. What do you eat? Mom's Rice Krispie Treats probably won't meet NASA's nutrition standards. And most importantly, where do you go to the bathroom? Toilets don't work in zero G either. Lucky for us, the book goes into extreme detail <laughs> about, about these questions and more. Here to tell us more, please welcome Mary Roach. Thank you. Um, um, this is my Tang substitute. Um, <laughs> on my book tour, I actually, my publicist thought it would be really a great idea to have Tang in the bookstores for everybody, so I would dutifully drink Tang until I realized my kidneys were starting probably to fluoresce. <laughs> um, tang, I always start by telling people Tang is not a NASA invention. Actually, I'm going to use this guy. Ooh, it's got a cord. <laughs> this is very old school. I like this. Um, can everybody hear okay? Is this even turned on? It's turned on, right? Yeah. Okay. Um, I feel like Merv Griffin. <laughs> uh, no, anyway, but Tang, Tang is not an invention of, uh, of NASA. NASA just would uh, order it from the store like anybody else. It is called a commercial off-the-shelf product, COTS product. And NASA actually does a lot of purchasing of COTS commercial off-the-shelf products, including the diapers, that they wear in the big puffy spacewalking suits when they go out to repair the solar panel or whatever, they are wearing an adult diaper. And I don't know what they're using now, but for a period of time, this is true, the Public Affairs Office told me this, it was a brand called Rejoice. <laughs> <laughs> Just like the most optimistic name for an adult diaper <laughs> that you can imagine. Um, anyway, so I, uh, th my book is, uh, it, it's a book about space and astronauts, but not really a, a typical book about space and astronauts. That, I don't know, they're necessarily a typical, but a lot of it, uh, there's a lot of sort of heroics and bravely going and coming back. And, you know, you have Jim Lovell in Apollo 13 fighting his crew and him fighting for their lives on the way to the moon, explosion, all of that. Um, that it's not that kind of book. I did talk to Captain Lovell, but not about Apollo 13. I talked to him about Gemini 7. Gemini 7 was fascinating to me because it was the longest mission to date. It was a two week mission. It was the first time people had been in space for that long. Before that, it had been, you know, a few days. And part of what they were trying to figure out at that point was, is two weeks in a spacesuit in a cramped space without a bathroom, without a shower, is it just too horrible for a human being? Uh, is it too much to stand? Is it too awful? Is it, do you get too disgusting? Um, so that's actually what they were looking into. And uh, I did, you, you know, you can um, look through the transcript, the mission transcript for all, for all of the missions that NASA has done. There's you know, these big, huge PDF files that you can read. And there's this moment in uh, Gemini, uh, Gemini 7 where the, the flight surgeon comes on the radio because there's a lot of information back and forth. It's a medical mission, essentially. And the flight surgeon comes on the line and he's talking to Commander Borman, who's the other, there's two of them in the capsule. He's like, um, the exact words were, uh, Gemini 7, this is flight surgeon. Have you had any dandruff problem up there, Frank? I mean, this to me just like, like the word dandruff in a mission transcript, an official NASA uh, mission transcript, just I don't know why this just delighted me. And then further on, the word lotion. They're like two grown men, like, you know, orbiting Earth, discussing skin care. And Commander Borman, Frank Borman, was sort of a difficult guy. And uh, yeah, after a while, he just stopped answering all questions about personal products and skin care. <laughs> it's like it was compromising the overall manliness of the mission. Um, but you kind of, um, 
you did have to feel bad for them because this is zero gravity. And uh, if you do have dandruff, uh, it's not going to fall to your shoulder. It's not going to fall to the floor. She kind of hovers. Uh, and I actually asked Jim Lovell. I got Jim Lovell to call me back. Um, I think because everybody wants to talk about Apollo 13, and nobody ever asks him about Gemini 7. And so you know, we got on the phone, and I said, so was it just like a snow globe in there? <laughs> He said, Mary, you're investigating a rather unusual aspect of space flight. <laughs> um, anyway, uh, so I wanted, you know, the book is about astronauts. It's about life in space. But it's also about space on Earth because I found out that uh, because it, space is this really extreme, hostile, unusual, expensive place where nothing that works down here works the same as it does up there. And you need to test it. And you need to kind of test it in zero gravity, if possible. And that's, that's a little tricky to do. You have to essentially put it on one of these planes that kind of flies like this. Um, so anyway, they, but they, they do, they test everything. They test um, even the toilets. OK, now a toilet. I, this is some, people take gravity a little bit for granted, I think. They, uh, you kind of think of it as a water system. You know, sort of, there's the sewage and the water. And, and, and you don't realize gravity plays a big role here because what you have is you have a growing mass, OK, that's being extruded. And um, at the, with, the, with more mass, you have greater gravitation. And at a certain point, the material breaks free and falls down into the toilet where it's whisked away and everybody's happy. Well, in zero gravity, this doesn't happen. It just kind of hovers. <laughs> and um, this was uh, <laughs> so. It, the, the, so the zero gravity toilet has to it, it has to um, give you what they call the uh, NASA waste management people call good separation. This is the holy grail <laughs> of the waste management engineer uh, at NASA. Good separation. So the toilet now has to provide that separation, and the way it does it is through airflow. It sort of entrains the bolus. This is, I got a lot of euphemisms out of my, uh, my time with the NASA Waste Management Department. So you entrain the bolus. Well, you have airflow doing that. It's like basically like sh sitting on a shop vac. I was going to say shitting on a sop vac. <laughs> it's like sitting on a shop vac or shitting on a sop vac, really, either. So OK, how much airflow, though? You need to know. Because if you've got too much airflow, you know, a suction issue, you could have some serious sort of um, uncomfortableness. So uh, they basically, uh, you got to test it. So you're going to haul the entire toilet over to Ellington Field and get it on one of these planes that does the you know, C9 like this. And as the plane goes over and down into a dive, you have about 22 seconds uh, of zero gravity. OK, now think about that. <laughs> you're testing your toilet. Um, this means some poor schmo from the Waste Management Systems Department has 22 seconds in which to perform. And um, I, I was never, I, I wasn't on, sadly, one of these flights, but I did talk to someone who had been on board. It was Charles Borland, and he's the guy who designed a lot of the food systems that the Apollo, um, they used during Apollo and, and even through shuttle. Uh, and Charles Borland was there with, he had like 22 different food system packaging, various things that he was testing to make sure it would work. And he said, you know, they had a, the toilet people, they had a curtain that they'd pulled, but you could see, you know, underneath the curtain. And as we go into the dive, you'd see everything start to hover, and you'd hear, like, go, 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 go. <laughs> <laughs> and the guy failed. I mean, <laughs> I mean, who wouldn't? I mean, I was like, if it were me, I mean, my colon would be like, you know, sorry, boss, 10 AM, absolute latest you can, I can do for you. So and this is why at NASA Ames, there's an engineer, and part of his job was to design a very high fidelity fecal simulant. So now no poor guy from Waste Management Systems has to go ride the, you know, the vomit comet on the toilet and try and go in 22 seconds. So, uh, so that, this is just a very long-winded, rambling way of saying that everything gets simulated in the most entertaining ways. Um, uh, let's see, they also do. Um, uh, the psychological elements of long duration space flight uh, are, are a little easier to, uh, and cheaper to simulate. Basically, you put people 
in a box for a while and you watch them and you see, you give them difficult, such stressful situations and you put in, you know, people of different gender and culture and you see how they don't get along and <coughs> fist fights break out and people claim sexual harassment. And so there's all kinds of uh, these interesting psychological simulations. It's a little difficult, I, as a reporter, I like to go on scene and be there. So I thought, well, I'll apply. There was one called Mars 500 you might have heard of that is underway right now. And there was a little three-month trial for Mars 500. And this is something going on in Moscow, a bunch of boxes on the ground floor of the Institute for Biomedical Problems, which if it were here, it would be Institute for Biomedical Solutions. <laughs> <laughs> but in Moscow, it's problems. So um, they were the Russian Space Agency and the European Space Agency were going to do this simulation. Uh, Mar simulated Mars mission and, and to work out the kinks they thought okay so we'll do a three month lead up just to see how everything goes and I, I thought well that would be really interesting for the book so I applied and I got as far as I got I passed the medical portion of it and various sort of filling out the form whatever and they said okay yes you've made it on to the next stage and I thought oh great they said we'll be calling you so some weeks went by and the phone rings and it's four in the morning and um, I don't really take care to hide my irritation that it's four in the morning and I pick up like, hello, and this is, yes, it's the European Space Agency and we understand you've applied. I'm like, D do you know what coast? I'm not, like, I don't live in Europe. And I was just, you know, the, the bitch that I am, especially at four in the morning. Well, that was part of the test. So um, I did not get chosen um, <laughs> to be part of the Mars 500 lead up. But anyway, the... Um, it's an interesting situation, the, psych the psychological, I got called a bunch for when the Chilean miners were underground, because this is a, a, a sort of an analogous situation, they call it isolation and confinement, and it, it does a very unique number on the human psyche. You, uh, space is a really, it's a frustrating place because you're stuck in this room and you can't, you're really soaking in it. If something is bothering you, you can't just sort of, you know, run out, slam the door and go for a drive. All the things that you might do to relieve stress, like going, for a jog, or having a drink, or a hot bath, or shopping, whatever it is that you do to relieve stress, you can't do that in space. So you get this frustration that builds up and up. And on a long mission, you got a lot, you know, you, it starts to kind of metastasize to just anger and hostility. And you, psychologists will tell you, you know, anger wants an outlet. So you're gonna, somebody's gonna get, gonna get it. You know, you're gonna reach the breaking point and get mad at someone. And in space, you don't want to get mad at your fellow crew members because you depend on them for your survival. You're only going to make the matter worse. So what happens is you tend to, it's called displacement. And uh, what happens, and you see it in the mission transcripts, that astronauts would just get really irritable with mission control. And uh, those poor guys at mission control, people are just like, I can't do that because it's on the other side of the capsule. You don't even know where it is. I mean, who, you know, just, just this really, you see in, in Gemini 7, there's this moment, um, Captain Lovell, again, uh, he's, for him, it wasn't mission control, it was the nutritionist, Dr. Chance. You're reading along in the transcript and you'll see Lovell going, uh, memo to Dr. Chance, uh, chicken a la king, cereal number 645, cannot even get material through neck of, pra uh, of, of packaging. And then like a minute later, further memo to Dr. Chance, <laughs> chicken a la king, all over window at this time. <laughs> At $300 a meal, I think you guys could do better. Just really, you could just, just like <laughs> letting them have it. You know, and hopefully Dr. Chance was getting some counseling. Like, this. Don't, don't take it personally. He's just feeling frustrated. So, um, yeah, poor Dr. Chance. Anyway, so um, simulations. Let's see, what else was I going to tell you guys about? Um, I'm going to do this with one hand. Um, mm. the, the third thing that you can do with your anger, if you don't take it out on Dr. Chance or the mission control people, you turn it inward and then you get depression. That's like a classic way to create depression in an individual is to have them have no real outlet for anger and frustration and turn it inward. And this, you, you, you would see for some of the um, Mir missions and longer IS, International Space Station missions that depression, there was some serious depression going on that some of the astronauts and cosmonauts have been more candid about in, in recent years. I interviewed a couple of cosmonauts who'd spent six months together 
on Mir, uh, Yuri Romanenko and Alexander Levakin. And I asked Levakin about this. I said, did you, did you find it a very depressing experience? And he said, Mary, there were times when I wanted to hang myself, but it's weightlessness. <laughs> <laughs> and you can't. <laughs> um, I, the, the cosmonauts were really, I had, a, sometimes it was a little difficult to get the kind of access I wanted or the kind of candor, candor that I wanted uh, at NASA. So I, you know, I went all the way to Star City um, in, in, um, outside Moscow. And these guys were great. They were, I was going to say, they're so down to earth. <laughs> That's not the best <laughs> term for an astronaut, cosmonaut. But um, you could, we just had really interesting conversations. You could ask all the things that NASA, you know, NASA, you know, they were trying to be helpful in their way, but they just don't really like when people bring up things like sex. And uh, so I, I but, I, but in, in Moscow, I mean, you could, like, I remember, um, I said, you know, okay, you guys, six months, a couple of guys in a can, you're young, healthy men. You know, is that an awkward, what do you do with your sexual urges? And he says, Mary, everybody asks me this. They say, Sasha, that was his nickname, Sasha, how are you making sex in space? I say, of course, by hand. <laughs> so he's like, why is this an issue? Who cares? Uh, so anyway, he was just, just a lovely, delightful person. Um, uh, the the simul I, I was going to, you know what, I think I'll read one little passage because it's kind of fun and then maybe I'll open it up for questions because are we, like how, I don't know how much time we have. Okay, I'll, um, I'm going to read a short section from the book just because it's kind of a fun section. Um, so this is Apollo 16 and um, we have Charlie Duke and John Young who've been tooling around on the moon, surface of the moon, uh, collecting rocks, doing their thing up there. And now they're in a radio debriefing with mission control. Out of the blue, Young declares, I got the farts again. I got them again, Charlie. I don't know what the hell gives them to me. I think it's acid in the stomach. Following Apollo 15, in which low potassium levels were blamed for heart arrhythmias of the crew, NASA had put potassium-laced uh, orange, grapefruit, and other citrus drinks on the menu. <coughs> Tang. Um, Young kept going. It's all there in the mission transcript. I mean, I haven't eaten this much citrus fruit in 20 years. And I'll tell you one thing, in another 12 fucking days, I'm never eating anymore. And if they offer to serve me potassium with my breakfast, I'm going to throw up. I like an occasional orange. I really do. But I'll be damned if I'm going to be buried in oranges. Moments later, mission control comes on the line and provides Young with yet more fodder for indigestion. Uh, Ryan, this is Houston. Yes, sir. Okay, you have a hot mic. <laughs> oh, how long have we had that? <laughs> That's been on through the debriefing. <laughs> the day after the Young's comments hit the press, the governor of Florida issued a statement <laughs> in defense of his state's key crop. Charlie Duke paraphrases it in his memoir. It is not our orange juice which is causing the trouble. It is an artificial substitute that does not come from Florida. <laughs> Murphy, <clears throat> oh whoops, in fact it was the potassium not the orange juice. The quote, coefficient of flatulence for orange juice to use the terminology of USDA flatus researcher Edwin Murphy, <laughs> a panelist on the 1964 conference on nutrition in space and related waste problems, is low. Murphy had reported on research he had done using an experimental bean meal fed to volunteers who had been rigged via a rectal catheter to outgas into a measurement device. Murphy was interested in individual differences, not just in the overall volume of flatus, but in the differing percentages of constituent gases. Owing to differences in intestinal bacteria, half the population produces no methane. This makes them attractive as astronauts. <laughs> not because it stinks, but because it is highly, uh, um, methane is highly flammable. Uh, Murphy had a unique suggestion for the NASA Astronaut Selection Committee. Quote, this, this wasn't a joke, this paper. The astronaut may be selected from that part of our population, producing little or no methane or hydrogen, hydrogen also being explosive, and very low levels of hydrogen sulfide and other malodorous trace flatus constituents not yet identified. In other words, he was telling NASA, when you choose your astronauts, 
make sure it's the guy that, that, to check their, what, their farts. Um, and they did not. This never was part of the um, recommended astronaut attributes that NASA adopted. But what they did instead is they became very careful and certain foods were blacklisted. Um, cabbage, beans, Brussels sprouts, and broccoli were, were actually blacklisted from, that, that you could not serve them in space. Um, beans, be, beans came back during the shuttle era and there are those who welcome their arrival not just because they're tasty. The zero gravity fart has been a popular orbital pursuit, particularly on all male flights. <laughs> <laughs> One hears tell of astronauts using intestinal gas like rocket propellant to quote, launch themselves across the mid deck. <laughs> As astronaut Roger Crouch put it, Crouch had heard the claims and was dubious. Quote, the mass and velocity of the expelled gas, he told me in an email that forever after endeared him to me, is very small compared to the mass of the human body. Therefore, it is unlikely that it could accelerate a 180 pound astronaut. Crouch <coughs> pointed out that an exhaled breath does not propel an astronaut in any direction and the lungs hold six liters of air versus the fart, which as we learned from Dr. Murphy, hold most, at most three soda cans worth. Um, <laughs> or the average person's anyway. Um, my genes, this is Crouch again, have blessed me with an extraordinary ability to expel the byproducts of digestion. So given that, I thought that it should be tested. In what I, I love this guy. <laughs> He's a retired astronaut, I should point out. There's just no way as an active astronaut you would ever have this conversation with somebody. Uh, okay, so I thought it should be tested. In what I thought was a voluminous and rapidly expelled purge, I failed to move noticeably. So there you go. <laughs> Um, I guess, yeah, we'll leave it at that. So, um, anyway, I would love to uh, answer questions that, uh, that you may have about uh, any of this stuff or any of my other books or my personal life or really just anything at all because we've got a little time. Do we have, we have a little time? Yeah, okay. Um, and, I, and, you know, I'll, if it brings up something of interest, I'll natter on in another <coughs> direction. But if anybody has anything they'd love to, like to ask about... Yes, sure, sure, sure. Uh, yes. So I remember reading your column in the days all those years ago. Yeah. My crazy favorite is the refrigerator is listening. I use it all the time in the house. So I was wondering how we got from that into my name of these. Sure. Um, this is you, wow. You read. I wrote a column for Reader's Digest years ago. It was a little humor column that had mostly to do with um, my husband, uh, uh, who's a kind of an interesting and entertaining individual. Um, Shush, the refrigerator. What was that one about? The refrigerator is listening. It's about like every time you talk about something, it takes down and then you have to spend on that. And then you've got some um, money in your name or something. And you were kind of excited about that, but then you were like, shush, the refrigerator is listening. So next thing you're Oh my God, I don't even remember. <laughs> I, I, I wrote a lot of those columns, but I'm, I'm sure it was really funny. <laughs> anyway, how did I get from the... But yes, because I went, I, this was sort of a strange career trajectory. I went from writing a, col a, a funny column for Reader's Digest to a book about cadavers. And people would occasionally, pe fans of the cadaver book would discover the Reader's Digest column and vice versa and go, really? <laughs> um, but I just, um, I, I had been wanting to, to work on a, lo a, a larger project. Um, the, the column was 700 words. <laughs> so I'd been wanting to, to come up with a book project and this was, um, I'd been writing a column around that time also for Salon.com and there'd been a couple columns that were, had to do with some sort of interesting, bizarre cadaver research. Uh, there were three columns and that and a conversation with an agent grew into a book proposal. It wasn't a, a lifelong fascination. I'd never actually, I was not suckled by morticians or anything. I, I, I'd never written about cadavers before. It just seemed like everything had been written about and except maybe like cadavers, I don't know, squirrels. It would just see there wasn't much left out there. I thought, okay, cadavers, I'll do that one. So that's how it happened. The, the, there was no real logical flow from Reader's Digest to dead bodies. <laughs> or not one that I was, I, I've been able to find. Um, yes? I, I'm really curious about your thought process as you're writing this sort of interesting combination of history, personal interviews, science, and humor. Yeah. How, does, how do you 
conceptually work your humor into this? Is it humor first, science second, or is it, what that's a great a great question. The, the question is, you know, hu um, how do you work the humor into the science and the other material, the other facets of a book? Is it the, do you first start with the humor, and or do you like insert it after, inject it afterwards? And I'm definitely when I'm choosing a topic, I'm trying to find something that will provide opportunities for fun and, and humor and surrealness and quirkiness. So choosing the right topic is 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 really important. And I try as I go along to work in the humor, but frequently I feel like it's not funny enough. So I'll take another pass and I'll look for opportunities to kind of just get a little goofier here and there. So it's a combination of upfront and and shoehorning some more of it in. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, so I love the footnotes. <laughs> the footnotes, yes, my favorite part too. And I, uh, in particular, in your new one, the, the comment about the anti-gravity class. Yes. <laughs> I was wondering how much research you leave on the you leave on the cutting room floor. Um, the the question has to do with my footnotes, which is the footnotes are places where I found something really spectacularly goofy and fabulous, and I it doesn't really f naturally fit the narrative, and I can't bear to leave it out, so I put it in a footnote. And um, the cutting room the, that that's why there's very little on my cutting room floor. It, th that's the, you know the, the anti gravity stones technically should be on the cutting room floor. They have nothing to do with anything. But I couldn't resist the whole story of Roger Babson, the man who wanted to defeat gravity and started the gra the Gravity Society, who are very unfriendly to me on the phone. Um, <laughs> we are neither pro nor anti gravity. Like, okay, good. So, um, and then I found out, yeah, that he had donated money for these stones, the, the anti-gravity stones, and, and like Colby College, a number of these colleges have these, because he gave a lot of money, they had to put the stones up. And the student body, when at some point, took to knocking them over. <laughs> it's like, haha, ha, gravity. Uh, it st still exists. Uh, so I, you know, I could, and, and that I think I did work some of it into the narrative. It's not all in the footnote, probably should all be in the footnote, or on the cutting room floor. But say, or, or, or I need to write a biography of, of Roger Babson <laughs> someday. But anyway, yeah, not much on the cutting. If it's good, it goes in somehow or another. Yeah. Do you work on, um, I noticed, I've read Stiff, and, oh. and, and remember the scene where the cadavers were being pummeled um, while <laughs> instrumented. And, and then I know oh, you the, the, cra the crash impact. impact. Yeah, yeah, you had a similar one in the in, in packing yes. the cars. Yes. Do you, work on books simultaneously? Do you go back to that place? Do right. they have anything? No, that's you great. You and you show up again? <laughs> Just let me know if you've got any space cadaver thing going on. No, the, the, the cadaver, the, 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 this was actually contemporary. The, the cada this NASA's work with a cadaver, which is in the new book, was going on while I was working on it. It was just sort of a fluke, and I stumbled onto it and thought, got to have that in the book. Because I always get mail from stiff, readers of Stiff saying, when are you going to do another book about cadavers? You know, like people are so like, oh, the next one's not about cadavers. So I thought, yes, I can work cadavers into the space book. So I, I worked my tail off to get access to that. I mean, it was, I heard about it, I forget where. And I, of course, I said to NASA, I, you know, I wrote the book Stiff, and I'd really, so, you know, cadavers are me. Um, I'd like to be there. And they were very uncomfortable with this and um, kept saying, no. Uh, the Constellation program says no. Did they? Oh no, the headquarters people say no. And finally, the guy at Ohio State, where they run the crash test facility, said, "Just show up. Just show up, Mary, and we'll deal with it then." So it was this quite dramatic morning of uh, the NASA people running down <laughs> and telling the graduate students, "Don't talk to her." Um, it all worked out okay uh, in the end, but it was a little touch and go for a while. But that was just a fluke. It was just a, a cadaver fluke. <laughs> Interesting image, yeah, yeah. So I guess one of the features of things like Apollo and Mercury is you've got two or three guys up in the capsule and thousands of people down on the ground watching them. That yeah. sort of leads to feelings of paranoia and that we're being watched and that would be different on a Mars mission. Uh, I think it would be very similar on a Mars, I mean, Mars mission. I mean, there, there, yeah, yeah. Well, yeah, you would have a communications like. But the question, the question was, you know, when for um, Apollo and Gemini, you've got these two guys in a capsule, and not just the thousands of people at NASA and Mission Control, et cetera, but everybody on the planet watching. 
And um, there be the, there are moments of paranoia in the like the, I found, and I don't remember which mission this was. I think it was it was a Gemini or Apollo, and I wish I could remember which one. Um, but the, the the astronauts start to hear this weird singing sound. One of them goes, "Do you hear that? It sounds like someone singing." And the other guy goes, "Yeah, that's really eerie." And then and it goes on for a little while, and, the, and then one of them says, "Should we tell them about it?" <laughs> no, I don't think so. <laughs> I mean, yeah. So they're. Um, yeah, I, I think it, I, I don't know how you how they dealt with that, but um, I think for a, a Mars mission, of course, yeah, very much sort of the the animal in the box that everybody's watching. Yeah, I I, I couldn't do it. Yeah. How is that situation different from other confined places like submarines, uh, the cave exploring? Yeah, um, it's not that different. In fact, they use uh, submarines. They use Antarctic field camps, uh, they use these as analogs to do research into isolation and confinement. Because Antarctica, you know, while it's not, you're not confined in a closed space, you are effectively confined because you can't wander, you can't go anywhere because you'll freeze and die in a whiteout. So you are stuck with the people that you're with. And it is very, very similar. I, I don't know, um, psychologically, I don't know that there's a unique, they, they talk about with Mars, um, Sorry, the question was, how similar is it, these analog situations to space? Uh, they talk about the one thing that will be different with a Mars mission, something called Earth out of view phenomenon. It'll be the first time that astronauts, you know, any human being has been so far from Earth that they can no longer really see it. And I asked um, Krikalev, Sergei, I think is his first name, who's a, the head of the astronaut training in Star City in Moscow. And, I read him a description of how they, they think, you know, once the, you can't no, you can no longer see Earth, like the moral structure of Earth will fall away and people may kill each other, blah, blah, blah. And I said, what do you think about this? He said, I think that psychologists need to write papers. <laughs> 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 so, so that's the main difference that I hear kind of bandied about. But they're very, very sim similar psychologically. Yeah? Astronauts have very competitive personalities. Did you see different reactions because of that, which you would have expected otherwise? Reac uh, reactions to? All the troubles in space. Oh, um, the question is astronauts are very competitive personalities. And did I see manifestations of that? But it, it is what's interesting, this is sort of an aside, but the, um, they, they are still they're competitive, but the, the nature, uh, the personality of astronauts has changed kind of 180 degrees from the Mercury and Gemini and Apollo era, where you had the kind of aggressive, macho, bravado, fearlessly going, large ego, that's now the wrong stuff because you've got much longer missions with you know, five or six people, so you kind of want a sensitive new age guy. You want somebody with empathy. <laughs> like the, 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 the actual, some of the, astro the recommended astronaut attributes are like ability to form stable and quality interpersonal relationships, <laughs> sense of humor, fairness, empathy, um, ability to uh, tolerate long stretches of tedium. So th they're, they are still aggressive. I mean, they still are um, competitive because it's a very competitive, there's not that many s jobs open. So they tend to be, yes, competitive, but not kind of the confrontational big ego types. They're really easy going. Chris, uh, Peggy Whitson, the commander on ISS, who um, uh, was up, when I was do researching the book, she was up and I, I, she'd be on NASA TV a lot, and the example that I tell people, which really, just to me, sums up what you, how you need to be to be an astronaut, the guy from Mission Control comes on and says, uh, Commander Whitson, you took the, you know, those photos that you took this morning. We can't find those anywhere. You know, if it was me, I'd be like, yeah, look again, because I spent a long time on that, and I have a lot to do up here, and I'm a little stressed, and I didn't get any sleep, so, but she just goes, that's not a problem, we can do those again. That's the... <laughs> That's what they're like now. They're not like, you know, Tom Wolfe's astronauts. Yeah. yeah. Can you talk a little bit about the process of how you choose your topics? Do they come to you? Do you have to search for it? Do you know what's next? Um, I, do know, I do know what's next, but I don't know. I don't have a file of fabulous ideas waiting to be written. And I wish that I did. Because every time I work on a book, I think, oh, this is it. I'm never going to come up with another idea. Um, my, I choose them. It's kind of a process of elimination. And now I'm thinking, you know, that word, that doesn't, that like says something else to me now. Um, since that chapter in the book. Um, but it is, the, there are only so many topics that work, that, that are going to have some history, some science, some fun, some color, some, 
I kind of know it when I see it. Here's an example. Um, Bonk, the, the book that, the sex lab book. There was absolutely a moment, an exact moment where I knew this is the next book. I'm, I read a reference to Masters and Johnson had done, they were trying, Masters and Johnson in the late 50s were trying to document the entire human sexual response cycle and for women some of that is interior. So they're like, well how can we do this? I know. We'll make an acrylic phallus with a camera and a light source and we'll have women have sex with it. And this is the 50s and I remember going, sex research, next book, that's it, right there. I knew, I absolutely knew. So sometimes it's like that and other times it's, it's just kind of like something I heard and how could I build a book around that or is there something there? So, um, and sometimes it, the germ of one book is in the previous book, so it's kind of a, and I love ideas, maryroach.net, send me ideas. <laughs> yeah. Um, yes? I think you said something like NASA has a subspecial department to suck the fun out of everything. Uh, yes, I know those people. Yeah. <laughs> so are, are there stories that you think are there that you just could not get or something they would not like? Oh, oh, yes. There are millions of one. I mean, the, NASA is, the whole space program is just delightfully surreal and ludicrous and I mean look what we're doing we're putting human beings up in this place where there's nothing for them they don't belong and I mean such a, the engineering challenges the, psycho, the psychological challenges plus it's a government organization and I think there's all kind I would love for somebody to as an insider to write a wonderful book about NASA Mike Mullane the astronaut Mike Mullane did a, a book that was pretty close to that he really did he was very forthcoming about the whole um, culture at NASA and what it's like. And uh, so I recommend that book as a sort of insider point of view. I was an outsider, so I'm like, you know, struggling to get whatever little scraps I can. But I have this sense that there's, yes, untold fabulous stories out there waiting to be put into a book by somebody who works there now. <laughs> yeah. Um, okay. One more question, yeah. Can you talk about how people deal with the boredom in space? The boredom in space, yeah. Um, it's tough because there's not a lot of recreational opportunities. People bring musical instruments. Someone, um, one of the Japanese astronauts brought a, a karaoke machine, which I think could <laughs> possibly have created some interesting psychological tension. Um, <laughs> Um, I'm sure that uh, e-readers, th the e-readers, e uh, the Kindle had not been passed for outgassing testing yet. They have to, everything that flies up there gets sent to this guy, he's like NASA's nose. And he sniffs it and they do these vol tests for volatiles to make sure there's nothing um, harmful coming off of the, and the Kindle had not yet been tested or any of the other e-readers. So I think that, you know, reading obviously, but yeah, there's sometimes, particularly in the long, the, the long duration missions, there's just not eight hours a day of work to be done and the boredom was apparently, that was part of the reason some of the astronauts were very depressed. That was like the main contributing factor was just nothing to do and the scenery never changes, you know. Uh, so, what? Um, yeah, I think, I mean, anything that's portable, I mean, you can bring, they have a weight cut off for how much personal stuff you can bring, but you, you know, you, you can bring up games, you know, guitars people have brought up and so, uh, it, it, it's certainly not a ping pong table, that, well, for various reasons, but <laughs> I don't know, that could be, maybe you could figure something out to do with it different, but yeah, it, uh, so whatever you can, uh, whatever you can bring up, Sudoku, I don't know, like portable stuff, kind of like a camping trip or a backpacking trip, you know, when my husband and I always bring travel scrabble. You know, you bring something that's not going to um, put you over the limit on your weight requirements. Yeah. Were there any jugglers or any kind of circus performers or stuff? <laughs> doing? Were there jugglers or circus performers? You know, some, uh, someone brought a boomerang up on the, either the shuttle or the ISS, and I thought, who allowed that? Just sort of like hurling things around with a delicate machine. But interestingly enough, the boomerang flew okay, which I, I, that doesn't make sense to me. but. I don't know why. I just didn't think it would work. But uh, uh, jugglers, yeah, that would be a challenge. Yeah. Uh, I think. Well, one more question. Yeah. Oh. Oh, oh, oh. oh, oh you were juggling. I'm yeah. Just that <laughs> yeah, I know. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. I was interested in you. Speaking of the footnotes, how do you keep focused in those wonderful archives? I couldn't imagine just end up being there for days. Oh. So much stuff. 
yes, how do I keep focus in archives? The trick is to not keep focus because it's when you get distracted and you go off and you start flipping the pages of some old back issue of some journal, you find the most amazing things. You may find your next book in the pages. So I, I'm a big um, proponent of, of following your distractions. And um, it, it, it isn't, I'm not a very productive person uh, in, in an archive or elsewhere, but I do, I do allow myself the indulgence of going off on tangents. Yeah. Thanks. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you.